Let's find Mark chapter 4. Um, I don't usually deal with one verse like this, like I did last week, and then will again today, but so much truth packed inside of these, I didn't think we could do anything else. But look, last week, as we began to talk about gaining spiritual wealth, and uh, it occurred to me again <laughs> this week, you know, you preach, to, you preach to people and tell them that God wants you to be rich. He wants you to have money. He wants you to have material wealth. It's not hard to get a crowd. I mean, I think I'd join that church if it was the truth, right? Uh, at the same time, having family that has ministered and given their life to the mission field, in the poorest country in this hemisphere, I've thought for a long time how, just how silly that idea must sound to those people. Because they look around them and, and most of them, all they will ever know and all they'll ever possess is squalor and emptiness and nothing. And, and yet we here have this, uh, we've, we've We've allowed our American citizenship to overwhelm our faith. And so we conform our faith to the blessings we have as Americans. And don't get me, when I say something like that, I'm not being unpatriotic. I love, I'm thankful I'm an American. Amen? Yeah, where's the flag at? We'll pl pledge allegiance, right? But I know this. I know that my true citizenship, my most important citizenship is in heaven. And one day, this earthly citizenship will pass away. It will mean nothing. Again, I'm thankful for what blessings we have here. Don't get me wrong. But don't allow that mindset of, of gain and wealth to bleed over into your idea of the gospel. It's just not there. That has... That's what has become the American gospel, unfortunately. And it takes many different forms, some more um, easily seen than others, but it, it's there. Uh, the truth is, Jesus did promise that we could have great wealth, but he wasn't talking about material things. I never forget, my granddad was in, I guess he was in... Uh, Myrtle, Mississippi, that large camp meeting down there. and um, I don't know if he was preaching that week or not. I mean, some big preachers were there. And I don't know if he was preaching or not, but somebody got up and, you know, said, I, will, I tell you what, whoever's got that big, long, white Cadillac outside, they need to park it, you know, out of the front door so it's not in our way so we see it coming in here. You know how preachers, they, you know, they want to rip hide on everything. And so the next speaker that gets up was J. Harold Smith. Many of you have heard of him. You heard him on the radio. And uh, he said, well, he said, that's my Cadillac outside. <laughs> he goes on to explain, you know, he, he's not trying to, to communicate that being a Christian means you are rich. But it is a shame that we base our faith in any way on how God would bless us except when it comes to spiritual things now these are things that we ought to seek we ought to expect because God's promised them there is great tremendous spiritual wealth to be had in a relationship with God but the sad part of it is nobody really wants that nobody wants spiritual wealth because you can't see it you can't touch it you can't you can't hold it always. And yet there is nothing greater in the world than wealth that is spiritual. So we talked first of all about what Jesus said in verse number 24. Now I'll remind you that he's talking to the Jews, religious leaders. And they were having a hard time processing what he was saying. And basically what he's about to say to them is that Unless you believe me, and as we talked in Sunday school this morning, unless you believe who I am and understand who I am, put my faith in me, then you won't have anything else. You can't go forward from there. And he puts it this way in verse 24. Take, hear, take heed what you hear. Listen, he says. 
with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you, and you shall, and you, and unto you that here shall be more given. So if you have faith in Christ, you can expect God to give you the next thing. If you possess the next thing spiritually, then on that building block, God will give you something else. And of course, what he's saying in that verse is that if you want spiritual wealth, you have to apply yourself. You've got to make it a priority. And, and that's what he means. But then he follows it up, that law of spiritual investment. He follows it up with what I have deemed to be the second law in this statement. And that is in verse 25, the law of spiritual enrichment. Here's how it happens. He says this, for he that has, to him shall be given. And to him that has not, from him shall be taken even what he has. Now that's a hard saying, isn't it? That, again, goes against our mindset as good citizens of this country, as, as, as good people of the United States of America, as good people of Burke County and this part of the world. That's hard for us to digest and hard for us to understand. There's an entire political theory that's built on opposing and standing against the idea that the rich get richer. Well, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but nobody's ever been able to solve that. Have you ever figured that out? You say, go, go to Russia and look at their economy. Communism was put forth to solve the problem of rich people garnering wealth. Well, who's got the wealth now? The people in charge. And so they stripped everybody of wealth and... And the wealth went to the state. So now who's got all the wealth and who's getting richer all the time? The Russian oligarchs and the government itself. By the way, this is not a political sermon. I just thought I would get that in there and twist it a little bit. Socialism's never worked anywhere, any way, anyhow, at any time. Now, I don't care what the motives are, it's never worked. And if you can show me a place where it has worked, I'll eat those words, but you can't. Now, why is that? Well, there is a natural law of gaining wealth. And you've heard it this way, in order to make money, you have to have money. Hmm. Especially in a capitalistic society, you have to have money to invest to start a business, or you have to have money to invest in the stock market or whatever. How do you get that? You get that by working. If you're honest, you get it by working and you, you invest it and, and, or start a business and you work and, and build and give other people jobs. And what a marvelous, that's just, that, why I'm thankful to be an American is we live in a country that's as close to being ideal as to how we sustain ourselves as anything any man's ever done. Now I realize that it's far from perfect. Don't get me wrong. We'd, we're greedy, and, and greed is wrong, but I'll tell you this, there's no difference in, in material greed and political greed. The people that want to tell you how to think and how to live according to secular principles, they're just as greedy for power as the billionaire uh, living in, on Wall Street. All right, it, it, that's just the truth. Greed is greed. So don't come back at me with, you know, I stand against greed. Well, so do I. But I also stand for gaining everything God wants me to have spiritually. In the same way that it takes money to make money. And I think this is what Jesus is saying. It takes faith to have faith. Now in Sunday school this morning you talked about something. And I'll, I'll build on this in a second. If you don't get past that, that Jesus is God, you don't have anything else. There's nowhere to go. Nowhere. And there are many other cardinal and important doctrines of the faith that if you don't get them right, then you're automatically on the wrong road and you'll never wind up at the right place. So I want to give you some examples of what I think Jesus is saying here. And of course, in a perfect world... Everybody would be happy, everybody would have a job, everybody would work hard. We know it's not a perfect world. 
It's a sinful world. But in our spiritual life, these things are constant. These things are true. And this is a law of spiritual enrichment. All right? So let's look at this. I think, first of all, this sort of harkens back to what we were talking about last week, but it also builds on it. When Jesus says this, that to whoever has, to him will be given, and to him who has not will be taken away, I think what he's saying is absolutely true of spiritual knowledge. Now think about this in a, narr- in a, in a material way, or in a, a natural way, I should say. There are certain things that if you want to reach a point of, of possessing knowledge of, or be an expert, you've got to start at a very base level. I remember a sitting in Greek class, and man, I took Greek in um, undergrad. I took it in, in, in seminary. Uh, I, I know a little Greek. You know, he runs a bakery in Jacksonville, but um, I know just enough to get me in trouble, right? I know enough to look up things and, and let experts help me. But I'll never forget sitting in seminary class. Here I am, and I was, no, not in that class, but I was sitting with guys who were way smarter than me, which is not a difficult thing to find. But there were, there were some accomplished dudes in there. And I, I remember when we started studying Greek, and at first when I took it at Southeastern was a seminar, and Dr. Black had us sing a silly little child jingle to memorize the Greek alphabet. I remember thinking to myself, I've gone to school all my life, and here I am singing the alphabet song to Greek letters. Why did that happen? Well, he knew that I could never, never conjugate the aorist or the present tense of a Greek verb if I didn't know the letters that made up those words. He knew that I could never talk about the the tense of a verb or the case of a noun if I didn't understand those letters. You have to start there. Now, unfortunately, while I had that memorized really well, and while I was in class, I guess I knew more than I do now, but not using it every day, you lose it, right? And I think about music, same thing. These guys, and Garrett did a good job this morning, didn't he? Garrett's capable fill-in part is, and um, Chris is a blessing. One of the reasons Chris does well, Garrett does well, and these guys, is they understand something about music theory. Now, if you've ever taken piano lessons, and you start at the, at the beginning, you were taught by necessity music theory. Now, that sounds all dry and boring, and, you know, I just want to play. Well, Here's the thing, you can hear somebody, listen to me play the guitar, and you can hear somebody that just wanted to play, all right? Limited. But if you want to enjoy music more, appreciate it more, if you want to play at a higher level, you've got to start with, with theory. You've got to learn something about what makes a symphony, what the parts are, how the certain notes go together, what makes up chords, all that stuff. If you want to really understand music you got to know that you go to Nashville and I've sat in on a couple of recording sessions it's amazing those people listen you can hum a song to them and they'll look at each other and say I hear one four five sevens there and there's a diamond here yeah let's go do it boom they walk in the next room and bah, there it is you think well they just know how to do it no they've reduced theory to a manageable number system. It's called the Nashville numbering system. And they, that's how they talk to each other. I, you might as well be talking Greek to me. When you're listening to that, I sort of understand a little bit of it. But they're just fabulous because they learned and understand those very elementary, basic things. I took three years of high school French. Has y'all ever heard of me say a French word from this pulpit? I can, I can sort of say bonjour, which is hello, or good, no, that's actually a good day, good, good, sort of greeting. And then au revoir, which is see you later, whatever. Past that, yeah, I don't know. I, I can sort of imitate Pepe Le Pew from the cartoons sometimes, but it just ain't there. I couldn't read a, a, a paragraph 
in French, I couldn't do it. Why? Because I didn't settle on those fundamentals. I, I, I didn't keep it. So by gaining knowledge, but gaining knowledge, I should say, is even more dependent, gaining spiritual knowledge is even more dependent on the elementary spiritual knowledge that we have to learn and understand. We talked, as I said, in Sunday school today, and that's one example I'll get to in a second. Let me give you some ideas of what I think Jesus is saying. Isaiah, God said this through Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 through 10. He, find, find Roman numeral 2, please, Adam. I think it's slide number 7 is where we're starting. And so Isaiah writes this, whom shall he teach real, or whom shall he teach knowledge, spiritual things? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from milk. You can't be, remain a baby and understand greater spiritual things. He that is weaned from milk and drawn from the breast. And then he says this. For a precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little. There a little. How many of y'all learned everything you know about the Bible in one sermon? Am I do that? Did you gain it? No. Well, you know whatever that is that you know spiritually you have gained over a lifetime. There are some spiritual truths that have to be built on others. Now let me give you some examples of what I think those are. I think the right foundation is critical, first of all, when it comes to the knowledge of God. You say, well, that's simple. Everybody knows who God is. No, they don't. You don't have to go far from here and listen to people preaching this morning. If you listen to them just a little while, you'll come to the idea and knowledge that they really don't know what the Bible says about God. Now, that's not that I know all there is either. I don't. None of us do. But if I want to know God, there's some basic things I have to know about him. Now, this is illustrated perfectly in a passage in Romans chapter 1. Now, I'm going to read it for you. I don't have it on a slide. You can turn there if you want to, or Adam can find it if you like. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Remember what I said earlier, that if you don't get certain things right from the beginning, you will always wind up at the wrong place. Listen to what Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and what he says and how, he says, men wind up at the wrong place when it comes to an understanding of God. Beginning in verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who hold the truth. They've been given the truth. It's in their lap. But they hold it in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest to them. How? God has shown it to them. How did he show it? Now, this is echoes of, of the 34th Psalm or 39th Psalm where the psalmist writes of general revelation we see in the world. Here's what Paul writes. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. <laughs> Boy, that's, nobody believes that today, do they? Can you look at the world and understand something about God? Yes, you can. But the world has decided to look at, at creation and at human beings and how God made us and reinterpret everything about it. They fall right into these verses. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. How? What? You mean I can look at creation and understand something about God's eternal power? Yes. You mean I can look at creation and understand something about the Godhead? Yes. Paul's going to say later that Jesus is the one who created all these things, and by him all things consist. Look at it. There it is. It's more vivid than black and white. He's drawn a picture for you. So it's seen so that they were out excuse, are without excuse because here's what they've done. 
when they knew God. They glorified him not as God. Neither were thank- thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. My goodness. That's where we are today, isn't it? That's where man's always gone. When he's looked at what God's revealed and said, no, nah, I don't think I'll believe that. I think that that tree wasn't created. I think that tree is actually God. When a culture decides that, they remain in darkness. That's why idolatry reigns in third world countries. And that's not a prejudicial racial statement. That's why they, societies that worship cows and, and trees and the sun, can let's just be honest, they've never accomplished anything. They're still right where they were thousands of years ago. If you're in India, you worship a cow, you might starve to death. Why? Because you won't eat it. I'm glad I'm not from India. What a foolish thing. Looking at creation and saying, that's God. That's my reincarnated, you know, great-great-grandmother. I, I say, you know, great-granny might be pretty good on the grill. That's all I'm saying. It's amazing, isn't it? We, we look at what God has said. And if we don't accept that in this world, we're, we're on the wrong road and we'll never get off of it. There's no racial statement there at all. That's just the truth. Paul finished and he says this. He says, professing them to be, themselves to be wise and became fools, changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to the uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. I can stop right now and you have heard a perfect statement amplifying and exegeting what Jesus just said. He that has to him will be given. Him that has not, it will be taken away. You see what I'm saying? If you believe God in the beginning, then God adds more. Let's continue. So if a person comes to believe that there are many ways to God, uh, he or she will never know him. If you don't believe that Jesus is the only way, there's no way to get to God. Only when one begins with the biblical truth there, it's the only way. that There's only one way to the Father will he or she come to know him through Christ. Which leads me to give you the second example. This, the spiritual knowledge, I think, gaining it is true of Christ's identity. We talked about that in Sunday school. Um, John said a lot about it. His purpose was to express Christ's deity in his gospels. Eight miracles, no parable. Every miracle was meant to amplify and to illustrate something Jesus said. In Sunday school lesson this morning, Jesus said, Before Abraham saw my day, rejoiced, was glad to see it. And then he said, before Abraham was, I am. John then goes on a tear giving these miracles. And what Jesus did in statements he makes, I'm, I'm the light of the world, I'm the bread of life, I am the way, I am the good shepherd, all those things. I think there's seven of them. I didn't memorize them for this morning, but they're, they're there. And so he says this in conjunction at the beginning, really set the stage, first five verses of his gospel in the beginning was the word the word was with God the word was God the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was a light of men the light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not no man has seen God at any time verse 18 the only begotten son which is in, is in the bosom of the father he has declared him he has exegeted him he has preached him and then John later in his little letter his first one chapter 5 verse 20 comes back to bear on what Jesus said and we know that the son of God has come and has given us understanding 
that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in his son Jesus Christ this is the true God and eternal life what's the message there I told the class this morning when's the last time you one of y'all had a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness visit your house nobody they've given up on us okay Billy they come to your house you wasn't there they left a note um I had a friend in Jacksonville. He was, I was teaching an adult Sunday school class when I was in my early 20s. And one old guy, he was a southern Georgia redneck dude. Good guy, but man, he was just, you know, he just say whatever he thought. He said, I tell you what, last time a Jehovah Witness come to my house, I told him to get off my property or I'd bark his head. That's what he said. And I'm like, you know, that's probably not the most Christ-like way to deal with somebody. So... One time, well, several times, it, it come to our house, and I guess our house is marked now. They they got a you know note on everybody's notebook. Baptist preacher lives here. Skip whatever. And the reason being, they send these young people up the door, and you you, you know you know they're young people. You look out in the car because they're older people. You know, protecting them, whatever. But they're training them. And I I thought to myself, well, this is awesome. This is a God thing because here's this young person. God's going to give me a chance to speak to them. So we started talking, and I listened to her. She was using the King James Bible, and I thought, this is even better because I can take it from her. I'm sure you know what I believe. And then I asked this question. I told the class this. I said, this is where we come down. I said, do you believe Jesus is God? And invariably, they sort of they stammer and start, well, well uh, he never claimed to be God. And I said, oh, really? So I take her Bible and I open it up to John 8 and John 1 other places. Very kind. I did not, I was not brash or ugly. And I read to her and I showed her. Now, here's where Jesus said this. And boy, what we looked at in Sunday school today, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. There's a reason the Jews took up stones to kill him, ladies and gentlemen. The tops of their head were blowing off. They knew what he just said. He said, the burning bush, that was me. (laughs) Whoa, whoa. He's either a crazy lunatic or he's God. There's no in-between. And so when it comes to who he is, there's no fellowship. There's no common ground if you can't get past his identity. And if we don't agree that he's God in the flesh, there's no reason for us to sit down and have fellowship together in Christ because we can't. Because the person that doesn't believe he is God does not know him, period. And really, that gets to the heart of what Jesus is saying. If you are wrong about me, if you miss this, then nothing else you try to do spiritually or religiously is going to matter. It's not going to matter. His identity. Then another example of, of the knowledge that he longs to give us is God's attributes. If if you don't get a handle on God's sovereignty in your faith life, you're going to be in a hole. You're going to be scrambling. You're going to be behind the rest of your life until you get a hold of just how sovereign God is. Until you get a hold of how holy he is, you're never going to really understand what he did to save us, are you? But then by the same token, if you don't understand just how much he loved you, 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 won't, you won't be able to grasp the magnitude of what he did for us. Spiritual knowledge, spiritual truth to him who has will be given. If you want to grow in Christ, believe the things the Bible says that you are having a hard time with. Embrace them. Hold them close. And God will give you more. I heard, I've heard professors say it all of my academic life. In third world countries, places where there's not a church on every corner, the stories are unreal. How that individually, sometimes men and women will hear just one little bit about Christ, who he is. And they believe that. And it's almost like God will move heaven and earth once you believe that small amount of light. God will move heaven and earth to give you more light. I'm not talking about financial payments. I'm not talking about stock returns. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about spiritual wealth. If you want to be wealthy spiritually, believe 
right now what you're struggling with. Get a hold of it. Make it a part of who you are, and God will act. Now, there's a second way I think this is true, and I'll hurry here, and that's in the area of spiritual ability. You know, from a natural world, I can tell all of you work out regularly, right? Uh, that was a joke, by the way. You can tell by looking at me the same thing in the negative. In the natural world, the more weight you lift, the more you will be able to lift. It's only one way. Only one way, you know, squat 500 pounds. I did it one time. Scrawny little high school dude. I've never been the same. At least my knees haven't. It's a true story. True story. But I did it. How did I do it? I worked up to it by beginning with 200, 250, 300, moved up. Well, so we understand that about the gym. Why do we not understand that when it comes to spiritual things? People say all the time, I want to do great things for God. Then you've got to first do little things for God. You have to do little things when nobody's looking. You have to be faithful in smaller areas when nobody knows about it. And then maybe God will bless you to do greater things. One of the problems with our old-time religion, we've come to believe that there are spiritual shortcuts. We think a trip to the altar will solve everything. I know pastors won't even counsel after somebody comes to the altar repenting of a sin. What a shame that is. You, there are only spiritual shortcuts. We act, any of y'all ever sit around and dream about winning the lottery? Yeah, come on, be honest with me. I know it's publishers clear now, so that's what you think about. You ever thought about that? If you had $10 million, what would you do? Don't tell me you've never sit there and, and, and brainstorm. I can see Glenda back there right now. She's thinking, I would have the biggest quilting machine Burke County has ever seen. Kid would have to build me a new building to put it in. Others of you might have something else you would do. We've all daydreamed about that. But I don't know any of you who've won it. I haven't. There is no spiritual lottery either. Now, you say, well, I've, God gained everything when I came to Christ. Well, yeah, you did, but you haven't appropriate, appropriated everything because God doesn't just give it to you in a flash. How do you get it? You do greater things for God when you obey in smaller things for God. Now, here's the problem. A lot of people are stuck in a very immature place spiritually. Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians 3. He just, he just I like the way Paul's blunt. He says, and brethren, I could not speak to you as in the spiritual people. I wanted to treat you like spiritual people. I want to counsel you and teach you spiritually, but... I couldn't because you were carnal. You were fleshly, even as babes under, in Christ. I have fed you with milk. I had to, and not with meat, because you were not able to bear it, and you still aren't. There's nothing, you know, if, I've often said this. If, if, if you came across a 50-year-old man who was still in diapers, you know something's wrong. Now, that's not a joke. I mean, that's, that's a real thing. Why? Something's wrong. There's, a, there's an issue. There's a handicap. Something is there physically. It's just he's never going to progress past that. But I'm here to tell you there's something far more sad than a 50-year-old biological male in diapers. It's a Christian who claims to have known Christ for 50 years who's still in diapers and drinking from bottles spiritually. When they react at the slightest provocation, say things, laugh at things, dwell on things, do things that are against God's word, there's a problem there. It's the same way with any skill or craft. You guys want to learn to do something? To, the more you develop your uh, skill of hand or eye or mind, the more you're able to do it. I, I started making guitars, you know, back in the pandemic when there wasn't anything else to do except call you people on the phone, check on you, that kind of thing, and it wouldn't even let me in the hospital. So uh, one of the things I had learned was, was how to use a chisel. Any of y'all any good at using a chisel? 
I watched somebody use a chisel that's good at it. I just like, oh, I wish I could do that. Because they, they can start here and just roll a complete, uh, just an unending roll of, of a shave, a sliver of wood off as long as they want to keep. Now, there's a couple of, couple of ways, for, reasons for that. Number one, you've got to have a sharp chisel. See, God learned how to sharpen it. But number two, you have to use it. And learn how. Now, I am certainly not an example for anybody, but I'm better than I was in 2021. A lot better. Other skills. Think about it. There was a time when you couldn't do things. Now you're an expert at it. Whatever it is, how do you start? You start with the small things. Spiritually speaking, Paul says this in Romans chapter 12. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Nobody likes to renew their mind. Why? Because it's basic, elementary, consistent stuff you got to do every day. You can't just come to the altar and renew your mind and that be it. No. Same way with repentance. Have y'all repented yet today? I'm not joking. How often should a Christian repent, pastor? <laughs> At least once a day. Probably more. But nobody likes to do that. We, we, we think we can grow into it on our own without embracing basic biblical spirituality jesus said if you have it i'll give you more but if you don't you're going to lose what you have philippians 2 paul writes this he says wherefore my beloved as you've always obeyed not as my presence only but now much more in my absence work out your own salvation he's not saying work that you can be saved work it out live it out Perform it before the world, your own salvation. Get to it. Learn the spiritual skills and do it. We're content just to, just to float along. And sometimes I, I, you know, the nominating committee asks somebody to serve the Lord in a church. And they're like, I, I can't do that. I'm like, why? Why have you not sought that ability by studying and applying yourself beforehand? Which leads me to the last thing. What Jesus said is absolutely true when it comes to spiritual responsibility. This is a true saying. The more responsibility a man shoulders, the more he can shoulder. I remember when I first started preaching, I'd get sick. I don't want to throw up. Sometimes I still do, but I'm basically over that. How do you get over it? Just do it. Just do it. I know people who have shirked and run away from spiritual responsibility, evading decisions, vacillating, and they become spineless, flabby, spiritual beings that really, I don't, I don't know what use they are to the Father in service because they don't want spiritual responsibility. Not that it's easy, it's hard. But it's worth it. Again and again in his parables, Jesus goes on this assumption. The reward of good work is what? Having more work to do. That's true in the financial world. It's true in the physical world. But my goodness, how true it is in the spiritual world. One of the things I've enjoyed doing in the past few months is watching these young men grow in the Lord. I've seen some of them make leaps and bounds, and I'm just thrilled. They have no idea. Last Sunday, we began adding the reading of Scripture to God's Word, which is or to service, which is totally biblical, right? And this we're told the scriptures to do that and I just it's been a blessing so far amen don't don't you know God is present when his word is read you're hearing God speak the most important thing you'll hear all day was when Tim read that passage then when I read my passage and after that it's gone downhill last week I'd asked Caleb to read and I meant to get to him before Sunday but he had expressed a desire 
to do it. So I'm like, I'm picking him first. And so there we are in Sunday school. I said, Caleb, I want you to read this. Can you do it? He sort of went blank for a minute. He said, yeah, I'll do it. I said, you sure? Yeah. yeah he's, I could tell he's like, all of a sudden, he went from zero to 150 on the stress meter. Because this is, nobody likes doing this, talking in front of people. But then he said this. He said, I said, Caleb, you sure you want to do it? And he said, preacher said, my mind says yes, but my heart and body says no. So he said. He said, my heart's beating out of my chest. And I said, what do you want to do? I don't want you to have a heart attack at a young age, man. You know, what do you want to do? He said, I want to do it. Now, what did he decide to do? He decided to shoulder a spiritual responsibility in spite of what he felt. And I'm proud of him for that. Now, you know what the consequences of that's going to be? Next time I ask him, his heart's going to beat only 120, not 150. And then the next time, it's going to be 100, 90, 80. Finally, he's going to get up here and just be smooth and calm. What is it that God would have you to do that you've said, nah, I don't want to do that. But you look back on it, and the reason you are not further along in your spiritual development is because you said no at a certain place and went and took the easy route. And because of that, if you're honest, your spiritual development has been absolutely stagnant. Now, again, I want to close with this. You need to understand, we're not talking about money. We're not talking about financial wealth, gain, material possessions. We're talking about faith. I recall the man that came to Jesus, and Jesus said, if you have faith, what he was asking for, I think he was asking for his child to be healed. He said, if you have faith, it will be given to you. And the, you, know, you remember what the man said? He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. In other words, he was professing just a tiny little bit of faith. That's all he had. I do believe. But Lord, most of it's unbelief. What did Jesus do? Jesus did what the man was asking about and gave him his spiritual desire. You may be at that place this morning and you... You're like, I just, I can't, I can't serve God. I can't do the things I want to do. How do you ever get to do that? The only way you get to do it is to obey in the little things. Because to him who has, who's already rich, spiritually, he's just going to get richer. The rich do get richer in God's economy when it comes to faith. Determine you want to be rich in faith, and God will see to it. Let's stand together. Lord, thank you for Jesus' words. We know, Lord, he was talking to people who didn't believe him, who outright rejected him. And because of that, he says these things. Implication being, if they were not willing to trust him, there really was no way forward for them spiritually. Lord, I pray for anybody here this morning who is at a standstill in their spiritual life. Lord, will you give them by your Holy Spirit the insight, the understanding of where they stopped believing, where they stopped trusting, where they refused to obey. And take them back to that place and help them to understand that the reason they don't have more, spiritually speaking, is because they haven't believed those smaller things. They haven't trusted in those smaller things. God, let us be people who line upon line, precept upon precept, build our spiritual life in you. And God, encourage us. We can't get there overnight. There's no spiritual lottery. But God, you have promised continued spiritual growth if we trust you. And so, Father, we'll lay ourselves before you right now. Speak to our hearts. Draw us near to you. To make that choice. To make that decision. To trust you. Trust you in the thing that we're struggling with. To give it to you, to, to, to submit to you in that area where we're struggling. Do it for your honor and glory. And I look forward to seeing what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Nobody looks like for... Can I play just for a moment?